Hi, everyone. Nice to see everyone. Hi, Cristina. Hello, I think I, I recognize some names. I recognize some faces. <laughs> okay, so just a reminder to everyone who's here, uh, we're actually going to be recording. We are currently recording uh, the workshop. Uh, so if you prefer not to be recorded, uh, we ask that you please put um, remove yourself from the video. You can just do that by going to the bottom left corner of your screen and hitting stop video uh, unless you'd like to be in the workshop. Okay, we'll maybe just give one more minute in case uh, more people are arriving. Okay. Here we go. So just as uh, people settle in, um, so I'll introduce myself. My name is Alejandra Perez. Uh, I'm the manager of the urban agriculture programs here at the depot. Uh, my colleague uh, Caroline Lapierre and myself, uh, as well as Mathieu, who is present, he's one of the participants, you could see him somewhere on your screen. Uh, we have been organizing these series of workshops for the last couple of weeks. Um, so this is a collaborative effort to bring you guys tips uh, to help with your gardening at home. Um, and as we get started, I wanted to uh, pose a question out there to everyone. If you have a burning question that you would like to have answered, uh, please feel free to write it in the chat um, right now. Uh, if you'd like to uh, give us a little morsel of your voice and you'd like to ask a question, you can also just um, uh, raise your hand virtually. Uh, if you go to the bottom of your screen, there's a section that says reactions, a little you can actually just click on reactions and you can, um, you know, you can raise a, you can raise a thumbs up right now if you want to ask a question and we'll unmute you. Okay. Well, we already have Maggie who would like to ask a question. Let me just figure out how to unmute. Matthew, if I'd like to unmute Maggie, how would I do that? Or can you do that? And Jane, it looks like maybe Jane wants to. So I just asked to unmute so she can unmute herself. Oh, okay. So Maggie, would you like to ask a question? I'm sorry, I just I'm just testing. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, and uh, Jane, did you have a question as well, or maybe that was a phone and you're clicking on it? Um, I typed it into the chat. Ah, okay, perfect. <laughs> okay. Okay, anyone else? Anyone have a, a question that you've, uh, you'd like to have answered by the end of this workshop? No? Okay. Other things that we can do to keep this interactive is if there's something that, you, that you're hearing that is really cool, uh, feel free to put a thumbs up as well or you know, give a little hand clap. Um, that, that's always motivating on my end to see somebody like, yeah, that's really cool. And I'm like, okay, all right, good. This is, this is helpful. <laughs> um, Okay, so let's get started. I'm just gonna share the screen here. Um, oh. oh, wrong one, sorry. Is this actually sharing right here? It is. It's not the one I want to share. <laughs> there we go. Sorry about that. Just having a bit of a technical situation. Okay, I think this is it. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll just switch this over. All right.
Okay, so today's theme, is everyone seeing the insects and diseases of vegetable plants screen right now? Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, uh, just Alejandra, you have, you have two questions in the chat, the burning questions that you asked. You, ah, okay, yeah, just one moment. I'll open this up. I can paste it in the, in the doc, but... Uh, we Can you do that? Yeah, because yeah. right now my my screen is reduced. Okay. Oh boy. So I'm just going to read it. The the, the first one is um, is it possible to clarify again if plant food and fertilizer are diff a different thing? Okay. Yeah, plant food and fertilizer. Okay. Is that any other question? Yes. Uh, what to do about cucumber beetles? Okay. And what to do about celery, celery mosaic viruses? Virus. Mosaic viruses. Yep. Okay. All right. So we're going to... We're going to put that aside for now and we'll, we'll get back to these questions in a little bit. Um, thank you. Um, okay, so insects and diseases of vegetable plants. Um, so just to sort of have a, a look here on this uh, page, we're looking at the, some of the language that we encounter in a gardening season. Uh, you'll see that the first section is preparation. So this refers to the beginning of the season, which we've already passed. Uh, this is something we would have been doing uh, in throughout the colder parts of the season, you know, maybe back in March, uh, as well as uh, April and early May. we will be planning uh, and growing our, our seedlings indoors, which are, would then be transplanted. Then we've got, whoops, then we've got the the growing season or plantation. Uh, so you've got some terms there, amending the soil, transplanting, staking and fertilizing. These are some things that we looked at uh, in, in our previous workshops. So for this workshop, we're actually looking at the third part of, uh, or the, the third component of gardening, which is maintenance. At this time of the year, uh, we've, we've mostly already done all of our transplanting, We've done a lot of seeding, we staked our tomatoes, and we've probably started some fertilizing. Uh, so the maintenance really consists of the seeding, the weeding, the watering, the pinching, and harvesting. But today's workshop, when we talk about uh, insect and uh, pest management, uh, we are really, we're really talking about something called scouting. Uh, so this is going to be the focus for today. Um, so just as a review, um, plants needs, uh, it's always helpful to know, oh, someone's got a question. Okay. Um, just one second. Is it? Ah, okay. Uh, no, just to tell you that uh, your screen is still the, f the first, uh, it's just the, f the first slide still. We, I'm not, uh, I'm not seeing uh, the second or third. I think you're oh, really? talking about something else, right? I'm still oh, seeing okay. insects and diseases of vegetable plants. And I think uh, other members as well. Yes, it's still on the title okay. on the first slide. First slide. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, okay, that's, that's very confusing. Okay, sorry about that. Um, on the first slide. Okay. Okay, are you seeing my, for instance, are you seeing my mouse right now? No. No? Okay. Do you see the mouse now? No. Hmm. Okay. I'm going to... This has never happened before. Um, okay. Let's try something new. Okay. Okay, do you see the mouse now? 
Yes. Okay. Moving? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. It's working. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Okay. Um, so, seems like one slide went missing, but that is okay. So, just as a review, um, we're going to uh, mention that uh, whenever we're gardening outside, we always want to keep in mind. Uh, our basic uh, needs, the needs of our plants. We always want to make sure that our plants have enough access to light, enough access to water, uh, and that we're taking care of the soil. These are some of the three fundamental ingredients to having uh, plants uh, that can grow healthy. Um, and when we cover these three basic needs, uh, in addition to carbon dioxide and oxygen, of course, uh, we support our plants in being able also to develop um, their own resistance, good resistance to the kinds of diseases that are common uh, to the plants that we want to be growing in the garden. Um, so once we get to this time of the year, here in Montreal particularly, we're in the end of June, everything has already starting to grow, is already starting to grow. The gardens look lush and amazing and we know they're only gonna get busier. We want to start doing something called scouting. Uh, and scouting is kind of a, it's kind of a fun word. Uh, I think of like boy scouts who are going out in nature or girl scouts who are going out in nature to do fun activities, um, to really sort of connect with the space and, and learn how to identify various things. Basically scouting refers to this process. Uh, but for us who are in the garden, just to really survey uh, the, the environment in which you're working in uh, and practice a few things in a systematic way in order to be able to, um, to identify or to notice uh, signs of early signs of disease or of pests before these things uh, become a bigger problem that, that is harder to manage. So how do we do this? Um, so first we're just going to break down uh, a little bit like what it is that we're doing at, at these when we're scouting and then we'll talk specifically about the various diseases uh, and, and things that we might notice in our plants. Uh, so we want to, we want to observe and what we're really looking for are things like diseases which consist of uh, fungi, so fungal diseases, which you can see right here. Uh, they're very, uh, they're very common. There are bacterial diseases, which you'll also find uh, in your gardens. And then you have viral diseases. Viral diseases are actually a little bit less common for us. Often uh, when we are buying our seedlings or when we're buying seeds, um, I ideally we're looking, we're reading the packages for our seeds or we're reading the descriptions of the seedlings that we're buying in the store. Uh, and things to, to generally look out for when you're buying your seeds or seedlings is to try and get varieties that are resistant to certain types of viruses. Um, we know, for example, like beans are really prone to all sorts of diseases. Um, but if you get uh, varieties that, that tend to have a resistance to those, then you, you're automatically um, opening that viral can of worms. If you do have a virus on your plant, there's really not much you can do. Viruses are a little bit funny that way uh, with the plant world. Um, so those are diseases. We can also have um, other things come up that we're gonna be looking for when we're scouting, is we can have physiological disorders, um, deficiencies, and others. So phys physiological disorders will really just refer to uh, things that we'll notice like growing patterns that we'll notice on our plants, uh, discoloration, things like this, which are signs of uh, problems that are happening to our plants. Uh, it could be deficiencies. Uh, maybe your soil has a deficiency in calcium or something like nitrogen, or you could have uh, ground that is very uh, compact. And so you have root development that is not so great and it starts to show in the way that the plant grows. Um, you might have excesses, um, so excess levels of nutrition, which uh, in a way can lead to toxicity for your plants. It is possible to give too much good stuff, uh, too much love to your plants. Um, 
So that's something to, to keep an eye out for. Um, insulation. Uh, insulation it refers to um, planting seedlings, for instance, outside a little bit too soon. So when they're not quite ready to be transplanted. So one, one instance of that would be uh, when, if you're growing seedlings indoors, maybe you haven't hardened them off yet, uh, or you haven't hardened them off enough so if you have seedlings growing indoors and you suddenly take them out in direct sunlight and you haven't acclimatized them to, to being in a hot space, to being under direct sunlight for a couple of hours a day, say for three, four, five days beforehand, if you do it just in one day, you're probably going to have a plant that's going to die. Um, if a plant doesn't have proper root development before you transplant them, it can get very finicky as well, they can also start showing uh, signs uh, of, of shock, basically. So it's a little bit like getting sunstroke. Um, uh, you can have lack of water. Um, that's also, um, you know, it would be a physiological uh, problem and you would, you would see the signs of having lack of water. You can see that in a number of different ways. We'll talk about that soon. Um, Wind, uh, I actually don't know very much about this. I know uh, uh, Caroline, she does. So unless Mathieu wants to speak about wind, I'm gonna skip this one for now. <laughs> Mathieu, do you have a... Well, I just know a few things about wind. First, first it could carry diseases. Mm -hmm. um, it's a way of expansion. And secondly, when you put your your planter in in a in a space where there is a lot of wind, um, it makes uh, the the plants uh, uh, preferred weaker. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it sometimes um, do not help the plants to uh, resist to different uh, disease attacks. Okay, so that's wind. And then we have uh, squirrels, or that would fall under the general category other. So it could be groundhogs, it could be squirrels, it could sometimes be other humans that are coming in. Uh, so they, they, they fall into this other category and we can talk about some strategies to, um, to manage that. Um, and then our, the third thing that we want to be observing or keeping an eye out for is insects. And there are, there is a plethora of insects out there. Uh, so we can't really identify them all in this section right here. They would, our, our frame would have to be a lot longer. But uh, every plant basically has uh, insects that really, really enjoy those plants. Um, and then also uh, plants that really don't like uh, those plants. And that becomes really useful for us to know uh, when we're doing things like crop rotation and figuring out what plants we want to uh, grow, grow together um, so that they can benefit off of each other's um, likes and dislikes. Um, okay, whoops. So when we, uh, when we begin uh, scouting, there's a couple things that we want to keep in mind. Um, we, when we're doing a walk around in our gardens, um, we want to be looking at certain things uh, on our plants, certain parts of the plants uh, at this time of the season. So you might choose to look at your tomatoes at this time of the year. They've already been in the ground for a couple of weeks. They're starting to grow tall. And this might be a, a prime time for them to start inviting uh, critters to munch on them. A part of the tomato that is very much loved by bugs, could be very much loved by bugs, would be the top. I think it's called the axial terminal. So this part of the tomato, it's basically the young, fresh part of the plant that is constantly developing new growth and growing up. Because this is a very active part of the plant, this is gonna be a, a part of the plant that is going to be very, very full of uh, nourishment, high in nutrients. Uh, it's going to be a little bit a little bit softer, a little bit more tender as it is small um, and probably more flavorful. So that would be an area that you would want to uh, look at when you're starting to do your scouting. Look at the top of your plant, of any plant for that matter. 
other areas would be um, the undersides of your leaves. So if you go to the main stems of your plant, um, you know, if you look at it from the top, uh, just the top of the, of the leaf, there might be nothing going on. It might look very bright and green and delicious. Um, but often, um, critters like to be hidden from their predators. Uh, and so it's very wise for them uh, to be hanging out on the undersides of leaves and particularly to be um, putting their eggs. If they, have, if they make eggs, they will tend to put them underneath the leaves where they will be less likely uh, to be attacked. So that's an, uh, another area where you would want to be scouting. Um, okay, so that's that. And then you can also go down to the soil. Basically, you're scanning, you're surveying the plant from top to bottom. So you've gone here, you've gone to the axle terminal, you've gone underneath the leaves, then you're going to want to go to the soil. And sometimes um, bugs will tend to fall on the soil. Um, I can think of many times where I didn't necessarily notice that there were cucumber beetles uh, on the actual cucumbers until I was hanging out close to the soil and I saw that they would fall into the soil and they, they would just kind of hang out and then eventually fly out. So your soil can also be uh, an area where you could um, find uh, pests that are attacking um, your plant. Um, other ways to identify your pests um, would be to get a hold of something like this little piece of white plastic. Get something that is white. It could be a piece of uh, cardboard, like a white box, or if you go to the dollar store and you get um, like white, uh, like Bristol board, um, bring that with you to your garden and you can actually take the leaves of some of your plants and just put your put your white surface underneath a leaf and you can just kind of lightly tap your leaf on the white surface. What you're really doing is you're taking something that's white, it'll enable you to see anything that falls off more easily. Without that white piece of paper or cardboard, you're in, an, in a space where the bugs are essentially more camouflaged because of all the various garden colors that are around you. So just having something that's white is really gonna be able to help you like ice like to emphasize the colors of, of the little critters that you're seeing there. So that's a neat and simple little trick. Um, if you wear glasses, bring your glasses. <laughs> um, I know I need them. <laughs> okay, so we have a couple already, we have a couple of steps. We know we want to do a walk around of our garden. May I stop you? Uh, I'm just checking. Did you change slides? I did. Okay. It's still on a scouting. How do I do this for us? Really? Yep. I don't know why that does that. Um, hmm. Has it changed? Nope. Hmm. Okay. So let me try this again. Hmm. Do you see it now? Yep. Okay, so this was the previous slide. This is where I was showing you the underneath of the leaves, top of the top of the tomato, the soil white piece of uh, paper. Um, okay, I'm gonna change slides. Do you see a new slide now? Yeah, okay, great. I'm gonna ask after every slide now. <laughs> okay, so, all right. So we, we now have a system. We know we need to walk around. We know we need to look at our plants, look at the top, look at the bottoms of leaves, and then look at our soil. Next, how do we identify what we're seeing? Well, as we had said before, it turns out there's many, many different types of bugs uh, and diseases. And so we need a little bit of support because uh, with gardening, we all know this, um, we're constantly learning. <laughs> uh, and so we do have a couple of resources that can be very helpful. Um, I want to turn our attention to our first resource, uh, which is the phyto.qc.ca. 
Um, it is primarily a French website, um, so bear with me. Uh, I can go here. Oop. All right. So what's really wonderful about this website is, though, I mean, it does say that you can click on English to have access to, to these guys in English, but then when you go to the insect section up here, everything is in, in French, but that's okay. We can work with that. Um, so what's really helpful about this website is you can actually get um, an archive uh, of the different types of conditions that can come to your garden. So we can look at, for example, all of the les ravageurs, like all of our, our uh, bugs here. Here. There we go. Um, so we can look, for example, for a black little bug that might be ravaging our, our arugula. Uh, Actually, let's go to les altises. Les altises à tête rouge. So if you click on les, les altises à tête rouge, you'll get next to this column, you get a list of plants that tend to get plagued by these altises. Um, so you can see here, you've got um, strawberries, you've got raspberries, You've got blueberries, you've got several different types of bushes, kiwi, hydrangeas, vines. And if you click on any one of these, Allez, you Rhonda, will get... Are you sharing oh. your the website yep. page? I am, yep. Yep, okay, so oh, we st okay. we're still in scouting identification and we have all the links, but we do not have the web the website page page. Okay, I don't know why that is. Um, okay. Okay, how about now? Uh, oui, on voit ton curseur, mais on voit pas la page. Hmm. I guess you... Mm. Do you see it now? No. Est-ce que ce sont deux pages différentes? No, they're the same. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. I am very sorry about that. Um, okay. Let me try this again. Okay, you see it now? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so this is the fido.qc.ca page. Um, so what I did is I went to this column on the left uh, and I went to this section here that says insect, went down to the arrow and it gives you a number of options for different types of um, things that you can look for. So you've got here, nematodes, for example, insects, diseases, viruses, and mycoplasms, physiological disorders, nutritional disorders, and others. So uh, what we wanted to look at was how to identify an insect. Um, you might already know the name of the insect. So if you want to, we know the Altise à tête rouge. We can click on that and we get a list on the right hand column of the kinds of plants that this critter likes. And then we can click on, for instance, something like vigne, so vineyard. And when we click on that, there should be a gallery of photos that comes up, but not doing that. Okay. Can try a melody instead. Okay. And we can look for mildew. Let's see. 
Okay, so we click on Mildu. Interesting. Are, do people see me? It seems like I'm having an internet problem. Yeah? Okay. It's not responding. Oh, okay. Here we go. Uh, and so we get, we can look at a photo uh, of what mildew in this case would look like. So these are the kinds of things that can help us um, get a better sense of uh, what we're seeing in our garden. Um, so if you look at physiological disorders, We can look for les tâches nicrotiques. So we might look for um, marks, like black marks on fruit, for example. Um, if we look at a gallery of photos, they will give you an example of what a necrotic stain might look like. And so here's, here's a photo of what that looks like here. Um, okay, so um, do you see the slide now? Are we back to, no? Okay. Okay. Okay, what about now? Yeah, okay. All right. Um, so these are uh, a number of resources that I, I recommend that you look into. Um, the Espace pour la Vie has, is a really great resource for a number of different things, not just, not just for insects and diseases, but you can also find information about um, nutrition, um, what different types of plants require, um, some ideas for how to uh, remediate uh, problems in your garden. But another interesting link is this one, the Iris Phytoprotection website. Um, I will reshare the page just because it seems like it doesn't always work. Okay. Do you see Iris Phytoprotection right now? Yeah, oh good, okay. Okay, I'm getting, it. I'm getting the hang of this, okay. Um, all right, so the wonderful thing about this website is it can actually be a little bit easier to identify a disease that you've never seen before on a plant that you, that you know. So what you do is you go to culture and you click on culture and you find the plant that you're having a problem with. Uh, so if the plant that you're having a problem with at this time of the year is a tomato, you would go to tomate. It asks you here, what part of the plant are you interested in, in seeing? Because there are certain diseases that will tend to pop up on a fruit rather than a leaf uh, or on the stem. Uh, but for our intents and purposes, we're just gonna have all the parts of the plants and we can get a whole range of all the different diseases that we can see. We're also gonna leave uh, the type of cause there. If you don't know what the disease is, you won't know what the type of cause is. So just leave it, leave it open. And it'll just, we'll have a, we'll have a world of uh, things to see. And we can just, you know, we can take a photo of our plant, take that back home with us to compare. And that'll really help us identify what it is that we're seeing. Um, so what's really helpful is you'll get a photo of the disease and you'll get the name of the disease. So for instance, maybe we want to look at something that's common at this time of the year. Um, yeah. So let's look at blight. So late blight uh, is, a, is a very common problem with, um, with tomatoes. Uh, it's one that's, that can be very serious. It can become serious very, very quickly. So this is one that you really want to watch out for and you want to start uh, doing your scouting now in order to, uh, to manage well. Um, so 
you've got here a great photo. What happens with late blight uh, is the, the leaves become brown and often they get uh, like powdery, like light powdery speckles on them as well. They're very light, uh, but the leaves become brown and dry. Um, what happens as the disease develops is you essentially get a lot of leaf loss. So you have less leaf, uh, leaf area that is able to transform light energy into food. Uh, if you have less light energy being transformed into food, you also have a plant that is less able to take care of itself. Um, and it just becomes a bit of a cyclical pattern. So when you see uh, these early signs of the leaf, there's a couple of things that you could do and the website will tell you. Um, so for instance, uh, so methods of combat, <laughs> method de lutte. Uh, so the first thing would be to remove uh, the leaves that have been affected. That's a really good strategy for all plants in, uh, in when they're diseased, is you want to remove those leaves and you don't want to toss them on your ground in your garden. Uh, if you leave them there, the chances of them spreading, not only to the plant that they've already attacked, but maybe to other plants, if they like other plants in your garden, they remain high. So you, you really want to put them in a compost, and the city compost is the best. Uh, if you have your own personal uh, compost, that's amazing, fantastic. However, the wonderful thing about the city compost is they are set up to um, regulate the heat, uh, the, the heat temperature that is produced on site. So they can make sure that they can actually zap uh, any bacteria or fungi that are on your plants. Uh, if you have your own personal compost, um, the chances that you're actually keeping track of temperatures over a number of days are quite small. Like, you know, we, we can do a lot with our composts, but one of the things that we're not as good at uh, is sort of keeping a, a trained eye on those things. So it's just easier to let that go to the city. Um, here you go. Okay. Other things that you can do, um, it's not mentioned here, uh, but other things that you could do are things like making really, really simple household solutions and remedies. One that we tend to use in the collective gardens uh, is we call it, we call it the, the BS spray. So it's like the best BS you'll ever come across in your life. Most people go like, oh, that's BS, no. <laughs> um, but this uh, BS spray, it's, it's baking soda spray. Uh, so you're taking five mils uh, of baking, uh, baking soda uh, mixing it with about a liter of water and a drop of uh, mild dish soap. Um, you don't need very much soap, just one drop is all you need. Some people add uh, maybe a half a teaspoon, uh, if not less, of oil as well. Um, so if you want to look at some interesting recipes that are baking soda based, you can always look them up online. Uh, people post quite a few of them, but this is the one that, that we use. Five mils to one liter of water to one drop of soap and a tiny little bit of, uh, of oil. Um, okay. And... Um, okay. So the wonderful thing about this, um, this website is that you can do that for all things that you've got in your, in your garden. So if, does anyone here have cucumbers in your garden? Like if somebody mentioned cucumber in there, like maybe raise your hand up. Yeah, okay, cucumber. cucumber. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so cucumbers are here as well. Hong Kong, there they are. So, here you go. You'll see, you'll see some examples of the kinds of things you might encounter uh, in your garden. Okay, so that's iris photo, photo protection. So now we're going to go back to the slide. I'm going to reshare it. Bear with me. <laughs> Okay, so we now know about scouting. Um, 
we need to talk about uh, our interventions. So when we start uh, noticing uh, things in our gardens, we, we need to respond and we want to respond uh, as quickly as we can. Um, so one of the things that I think makes, makes our work in the gardens easier is a little bit of preparation. So this would be more like preventative intervention. Uh, so this would be things like making sure that we uh, rake sick leaves. We, we talked about those. So when we're removing sick leaves from our plants, we want to get rid of them, not leave them in our gardens. Um, we want to plant resistant varieties of the things that we've chosen uh, to grow that season. We talked about that. Uh, we want to plant the good plant in the right space. So what does that mean? So that means uh, that when we're planting, um, or when we're planting our, our seedlings, we want to make sure that, for instance, our cucumbers uh, are given enough sunlight and we want to make sure that they have enough space to grow in. Um, something that's particularly true for all the plants that are in the curcubit family is that they tend to be a lot more susceptible to things like powdery mildew. Uh, so more like uh, fungal types of diseases. So if we give them the right space, they have enough aeration happening around their leaf. Uh, they're less likely to get sick or they're less likely to get sick early on in the season. Uh, most people tend to get uh, blight in their squash family at some point. So it really is about um, being able to manage that early on and spacing will do a lot for that. Then we've got crop rotation. We have a lot of fun with this in the collective gardens. We talk a lot about crop rotation. Um, so that also means that, you know, if I planted uh, tomatoes in one bed the previous year, you know, in 2019, in 2020, I want to plant a different type of uh, plant, one that is not in the same family as a tomato, so not a solanaceae, uh, so not peppers, but something that would be in the leafy green category of plant. So a lettuce, a spinach, a kale. Uh, and what that does is if there was any blight uh, left uh, in that bed from that year, if we plant something else in that bed the following year, chances are whatever bugs were attacking those plants the previous year, they won't survive. Even if uh, those, you know, if there were bugs that left eggs as they hatch uh, in the spring or whenever it is that they're that they, uh, they're born, they won't have immediate access to food, and so they will eventually just die off. So crop rotation is one of its benefits is that it actually also helps protect from, from disease and from pests. Um, so that would be, we would call that a cultural method uh, intervention. And so as we go down through this list, we're actually looking at uh, methods that are uh, the least imposing and that almost fall into this category of just general good practice in the garden. You know, good idea to always rake your leaves. Um, two more invasive, more imposing methods. So we move into physical methods, things like uh, netting or using row cover, which we use quite a bit in our gardens. So when you have your um, certain types of plants that maybe don't get very tall, you can actually drape something called row cover over top of them. And that can protect certain seedlings uh, from certain types of bugs. So we've done that, for example, for flea beetles in the gardens. We know that flea beetles um, can, uh, yeah, they, if you cover your, your uh, brassica family plants with row cover early enough, flea beetles won't be able to get in under the row cover and so they just won't have access to, um, to your seedlings. We've got something like copper rings around plant stems. Uh, these, uh, the copper rings speak specifically to slugs. Uh, who here has had slugs in their garden and doesn't know what to do about them? Anybody? I'm just trying to see. No, nobody. So slugs, uh, we, we have quite a few of them in the gardens and slugs uh, don't like uh, the copper rings. There's something about the copper rings that actually kind of burns their skin a little bit. So whenever they encounter a copper ring, they're like, oh, oh, that doesn't feel good to my body. I'm going to turn around the other way. Um, it, I've never bought them. I, I would imagine they are a little bit more costly, so it's not always um, the most economic approach, but it is an approach. One that is um, a little bit, you can think of it as uh, perhaps a bit more holistic, is buying plants or getting plants that work really well 
with the plants that you're currently growing. So people talk about um, companion planting. Uh, so getting, for example, um, the capucine or what, otherwise known as nasturtiums and planting those close to your tomatoes or certain beds, there are gonna be um, bugs that really prefer to hang out with the nasturtiums versus uh, something like your tomatoes uh, or your kale. Um, and so you plant those in part for beauty, in part because they attract uh, pollinators and they attract bugs that, um, that might also be interested in your vegetables. Um, so that's a really, really smart way of planting your garden. We have mechanical methods. So we have sticky traps. Um, somebody asked about cucumber, I think cu um, the cucumber beetle. I'm not sure who asked that question, but the cucumber beetle, um, there isn't too much that we can do, but it actually, we, the only thing that we've ever done is we've set up sticky traps, which are effective, but they also trap everything in its way. So sticky traps are not selective. So you might actually be trapping uh, beneficial pollinators when you use sticky traps, but you will also get your um, cucumbers, the cucumber uh, beetle. The most effective way that we have found for us is uh, literally picking them with our hands. <laughs> so it's one of those like meditative activities. Um, I take usually like a little bowl of water with a, a little bit of soap in it and I literally will catch them with my fingers because if you don't catch them with your fingers, they will fly and literally just toss them in this uh, soup of soap. Um, and it, uh, it really is, uh, for the cucumber beetle, uh, a practice that just needs consistency because they also breed really quickly. Uh, often, um, you might even find them mating on your plant. And so sometimes you can get two of them in one go <laughs> and you put them in, in the bowl of, of soapy water. Um, and then you have, of course, uh, trap plants, which is really just another way of also talking about this companion, uh, con companion plant planting. So choosing plants that you know are really good at um, um, trapping or attracting the bugs that you don't want to be eating your uh, tomatoes or your kale or um, your beans or something like that. We've got biological methods. Um, so one is predator using predator insects. A classic example would be uh, using the uh, ladybug, so les coccinelles, um, who uh, basically take charge of eating aphids. Uh, you can actually buy them, you can order them, and they're really great uh, at doing that. Um, we've got, um, I've never used these, but they, they exist, the parasitoid insects. So these are insects that will tend to lay eggs uh, inside the bodies of other insects, and those eggs grow inside the other insects, and then those insects die. So it's like a very very interesting method. It's not, not one that, that we use at the collective gardens, but it exists. It is there. Um, again, we go back to this idea of biodiversity in the garden. Um, we highly, highly encourage that if you have the space and you're able to grow several different types of things, always beneficial. The more diversity you have in a garden, uh, the harder it actually is for uh, certain, uh, you know, certain pests to know where their preferred vegetables are uh, in part and you can think about this it's kind of like you know maybe going to um, uh, I don't know to a show or a space where there's like lots of people and lots of music and all these things happening it's like there's a lot of stimulation that happens in a garden space in a way it kind of confuses pests so it takes them a little bit longer to get to where they need so but having diversity in a garden space is not the same as uh, saying overcrowd your garden that's making sure that we we make that distinction uh, when we when we increase the biodiversity in our garden. Um, the we also have bacteria and entomopathogenic fungi. Um, the of these, there's one that we have used uh, in the collective gardens, and that's something known as Bt. It's a type of bacillus. Uh, bacteria liquid. Uh, this one's really great uh, for particularly for the cabbage uh, worm and the cabbage moths. Uh, so these are ones that you would use early on in the season just as you start to see the cabbage uh, signs of the cabbage um, worm. 
Uh, and what that does is the cabbage worm then starts eating it and then before it, it develops uh, into a moth, uh, it dies. If you wait too long uh, to use it, it's not as effective because by then you have, um, the moths have gone through their full cycle. So not only will they have been eating your uh, vegetables while they were worms, but they will also be feeding off of them as moth. Um, Mathieu, is there anything you'd like to add about the entoma pathogenic fungus? I've never used this, so I don't, uh, I don't have much to say about it. Okay. <laughs> um, Stay here. Uh, okay. All right. Research for the future. Um, then we also have chemical methods. Um, so our, our favorite chemical method in the collective gardens is the plant teas. Um, plant teas, uh, has anyone here used them before? I don't see any hands. Uh, so plant teas, uh, in French, they're also known as purin. Um, they're very stinky. Uh, basically, you take uh, the leaves of plants uh, that, you, that you want to be turning into a tea. Usually, you choose plants that are high in nutrients, uh, typically something like a comfrey or like a stinging nettle. Uh, someone recently told me about uh, tomato leaves can also be used. They would need to be um, disease-free uh, leaves, but you can use plant teas as a way of um, preventing uh, disease. It is said that um, plants uh, that are fed with plant teas tend to have higher immune systems. Um, they're really repelling even to humans. Like when I smell that thing as it's brewing, like I just, I gag. It's not my favorite, but some gardeners swear by it. Um, so you can look, you can look for uh, recipes online. Um, plant teas just take a little bit of time to make. You need to plan ahead a little bit because it usually takes about 10 days, seven to 10 days to make one. Uh, you need to fill up a bucket uh, half with plant matter, then you fill it up with water, then you cover it. Uh, and every day you would open your lid and give it a nice, um, take a spatula or something to stir to get some uh, aeration going on in there and then you cover it again. And so with each day it gets stinkier and stinkier. And when you've got like top quality stink, you know this thing is ready, usually about seven to 10 days. Um, then you also have homemade pesticides, which we will talk about in a couple minutes and uh, biopesticides. So. Are you seeing the new slide? Yeah, oh great, okay. Um, so plant problems. Um, so we talked, uh, we talked a little bit about the plant problems that you can uh, have in your garden. Uh, typical diseases involve spots on leaves. That's, that happens very, very commonly. Uh, when they have uh, a halo, um, that's usually, you, you want to keep an eye out for that halo. Usually that, that's a sign that you might have something like, uh, like a virus. Um, so you want to look into that right away. Um, there's a, a great website here that gives you um, descriptions of various types of diseases. So this is the Jardinier Paresseux. Um, so here, for example, you've got. Um, we can the, we can see it, Alejandra. Oh, you can't see it. Okay. All right. I need to oh, just a second. Uh, okay, so I'll just go through this one a little bit quickly because we're running a little bit long time. Um, but this is a great uh, website to visit. Um, uh, this gentleman here posts about a number of different types of pests that are very common in gardens, uh, vegetable gardens. So the first page we open up, we see we've got here the leaf miner. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this before in your garden, um, but it's, uh, it's a bug that basically um, mines the inside of, of its of the leaf of the beet, the Swiss chard. Uh, sometimes uh, I've seen it munch on um, some uh, brassica 
type uh, leaves, but its favorites really are uh, beets and Swiss chard. Uh, with these guys, there really isn't too much you can do uh, except get rid of the leaf, throw it out, don't put it in your compost. Uh, some people will go as far as trying to look for the bug and squishing it before they throw it out. Uh, so you can decide how, how passionate you want to be. Um, but the best practice is to remove the leaf. You can see another sign of, uh, of the leaf miner. Here's a, some maggoty looking leaf miners inside the leaf here. Um, and so he'll talk about ways to treat it. So this is the, the row cover that we were talking about a little bit earlier. So this is the kind of fabric that you can lay uh, on your garden beds to prevent certain types of uh, pests. Uh, and these you can, you can buy at a pepiniere, like pepiniere jasmin. Uh, you can order them online. Uh, typically, you don't find them in larger stores uh, like Canadian Tire. You probably won't find it. You really need to go to a more specialized uh, garden shop to get it. If you have friends who are also gardeners, I highly recommend uh, chipping in and going on, on a roll because uh, they are a bit pricey. And if you have a small garden space, uh, you might have way more than you need uh, in one season. So it's super beneficial to collaborate with your friends and fam. Um, okay, so this is the jardinierparisseux.com. Um, go back to the slide. Okay. Okay. All right, whoops, here we go. Um, so now we're going to look at some plant deficiencies because uh, these this does uh, happen in our gardens uh, and it's it's best to be able to to have things to look for so that you know how to remediate um, some of your plant problems. Um, so when you start seeing uh, leaves, particularly young leaves, if you go to the top of this plant that look a little bit misshapen or a little bit funny looking. You might, you might actually have a bit of a calcium deficiency. Um, in the collective gardens, what we do uh, for calcium is when we plant our seedlings, we always use something called shrimp powder. Uh, and we actually take about a tea, like a heaping teaspoon of the shrimp powder. We open our hole and we plant our, our, uh, our seedling. We mix it into the hole uh, and then put our seedling in and close the hole in water. Uh, so if you have a calcium deficiency later on in the season, um, you could rake a little bit of shrimp powder around, um, around your plant. Um, there are fertilizers that you can use that will also have uh, doses of things like calcium. Uh, shrimp, uh, shrimp uh, fish emulsion, for example, is something that we use on many of our plants, not all of our plants throughout the season, and that will ensure that there's uh, good levels of calcium as well as other um, nutrients, uh, particularly. Um, minerals that are good for your plant. Um, nitrogen, this is a really common one too. Um, so when you have uh, upper leaves that are starting to turn light green uh, and your lower leaves are uh, yellow, um, you are starting to see a pattern of a plant that is like it's still it's it's growing but it's needing something uh, yellowing, we, when we see yellowing, um, light green, we want to think of uh, nitrogen. Uh, one way to remediate that would be to use um, fish emulsion is really high in nitrogen. Um, that's one immediate way of uh, giving your plants a boost. Um, we've got potassium, uh, which is yellowing at the tips and the edges usually in younger leaves. All of the problems of deficiency are, can be remediated by uh, using um, amendments, which we talked about at the last workshop. So I highly recommend uh, for everyone to get your hands on some algae uh, liquid if you can, uh, some fish emulsion. And so when you start seeing these colors, if there's no bugs, you've done your scouting, there's nothing there, use uh, your amendments. If after you've used amendments, you still don't see any bugs, your plant is still struggling, 
um, you might actually want to look at the root of your plant. There are diseases uh, that will plague your roots. Uh, and if your roots are diseased, the best thing is actually to remove that plant before um, the disease gets passed on to the neighboring plants, uh, to their roots. Um, so continuing on with the idea of physiological disorders, um, water uh, and sunburn is actually quite common. Uh, so when you start seeing, as we see on this uh, squash family plant here, the yellowing of the leaves at the borders with a little bit of brown on the sides, that's usually a sign of uh, lack of water. Um, so I always like to remind people that wat watering seems like it's like the easiest activity in the garden, but it's one that, you know, because it is so simple and we can all often overlook uh, how things like just paying attention to how long it takes for water to absorb in the soil, we can overlook the importance of that. Uh, the, the simple easy trick is um, you want your water to drain in about three, uh, three 1,000 seconds. So you would water your plant, create a bit of a puddle around the, around the plant and start counting. You go one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000. If the water drained in less than three 1,000s, your bed is actually still very thirsty. Your plant needs more water. If it drains in more than three one seconds, you are in the clear, you're fine. You also don't want to overwater. Um, that's one. And uh, sunburn can happen if you water your plants uh, in the middle of the day in bright sunlight. Uh, the sun, uh, the, the water acts as a, as a bit of a magnifying glass uh, and it basically magnifies the heat of the sun and can burn leaves. So that can also confuse uh, our process of trying to figure out what's happening with our plants. If like, if there are some brown edges, we might think, oh, maybe it's not enough watering. Or like, oh, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's the mosaic virus. Um, we really, you know, we need to pay attention to several different uh, factors as we're trying to figure out um, what's happening with our plants. All right, so we've looked at powdery mildew. We've looked at blight. We've looked at les altis. Uh, we talked about slugs um, and how we, people use BT or the copper rings. Uh, and we've talked about aphids, but we didn't share any recipes. So aphids, um, they're very common. Uh, we did talk about actually the ladybugs. That is one solution. We also have uh, a recipe that you can use for dealing with uh, Aphids. There are many, but one that is kind of neat that I thought I would share today um, is there are, okay, let's share two actually. One is if you are also growing rhubarb in your garden, um, you probably know you have parts of your plant that are toxic, the leaves, and usually you would throw those out, um, but you can actually save those and use, use the, the toxic leaf as a natural um pest deterrent uh it can work for aphids and you would just need to boil 500 grams uh, of this leaf in three liters of water for about 30 minutes you filter it uh wait till it cools down and use that as a spray um alejandra what's the name of the green bug the green insect ah that's an aphid a, a what Aphid? Aphid? Ah, aphid. Uh, les pousses? Les pousserons? Ah, un pousseron, ok, oui, ok. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, pousseron. Um, another more common one, but this one would require additional ingredients, uh, would be a, a garlic water spray. Uh, this one is quite effective, uh, but it would require just a couple more ingredients. So you could take uh, 50 to 75 milliliters of garlic, so we're looking at the volume of the garlic, to four liters of water. And you would soak that uh, for 12 hours, filter it, and then you want to add 
about four mils of alcohol before applying as an insecticide. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about the strength of the alcohol. Um, garlic is in itself already quite antiseptic. Um, but if you want to just sort of veer on, uh, you know, you don't want it to go bad too easily, maybe you want to use it for like two days, like go for that strong, you know, the strongest thing that you got, and maybe a little bit of brandy, uh, something in the 40s, um, even if you can get 50s these days, but um, high, higher percentage of alcohol is preferable. If you go a little lower, no problem. You're only going to spray it generally one time anyway. Uh, it's not going to spoil on the on the body of the plant. You really just want to get that garlic in there. The garlic is going to be doing most of the action. Um, Alejandra, someone is asking how much garlic. Uh, how much garlic? Yeah. So it would be uh, 50 to 75 mils uh, for four liters of water. I'm not sure how much that translates into in, um, in grams. Um, but we're really just looking at the volume. Uh, so 50, 75 mils, that's like half of a half of a quarter cup. So it's an eighth, an eighth of a cup. <laughs> you can chop it up too, uh, to bits. Um, okay, and so other bugs that we have, we didn't talk about this one right here, the Japanese beetle. Uh, the Japanese beetle is a really great example of a bug that uh, likes to eat everything. Most bugs are very have very specific tastes, and so you can usually work uh, with that um, in order to, you know, attract them into other areas of the garden. But the Japanese beetle, they love beans and they love all the sweet things, but in the absence of those sweet things or in the excess of a family of Japanese beetles, they will eat what they can. <laughs> um, so what we have used uh, have been two methods. We've used the mechanical, like simple mechanical method, which is sweeping them into that bucket of soapy water. Um, that's one. Uh, the other one is we have bought uh, a Japanese beetle trap, which basically has, they sell them in like, they sell you these plastic bags with like a little container of a certain type of hormone that attracts them. And you're meant to place them somewhere far enough away from the garden that they'll be attracted by that scent. And then they get trapped in the bag and you just leave, leave the bag there for a couple of weeks until the bag fills up. Um, that's been the, those two have been the best methods. Um, additionally, if, you, if you've had the Japanese beetle in the past, uh, it's, it'll be a great idea to look up um, a photo of the larvae of the Japanese beetle. They're actually quite beautiful. I'm looking for one right now and I will share it with you. This will be the last slide of the day. Here we go. Japanese beetle. Let's... Hold on a second. I'm going to make this bigger so you can see it. Whoop. Um... Here we go. Okay, so this is the Japanese beetle. This is the Japanese lar beetle larva. It's actually significantly bigger than the, actually, the actual full developed plant. It's kind of beautiful and you find it in the soil. So in the spring, as you're prepping your beds, uh, if you've had Japanese beetle in the past, keep an eye out for this particular larva. It's, uh, it's partly white and then its butt is like kind of grayish bluish. Just pull them out, get rid of them. Um, we put them in soapy dishes in the past. That's the best way to reduce their numbers. Uh, if anybody here has experienced them, they also reproduce very, very quickly. Um, and once they start eating your plants, like you can see, like you can look at this little picture right here, like you lose a lot of foliage very quickly and it can really affect your plant. Um, so other prevention or control methods are using row cover, uh, neem oil, you can find neem oil recipes online. You just, you buy the essential oil, you mix it with water and a tiny little bit of soap. Um, also super effective. Um, go back to slide here. And we have, we have here a 
actually a really lovely guide for gardeners uh, on this slide. Um, but I believe, Mathieu, do we share, we do share the slide uh, presentation with, with participants, right? Uh, no, we, <clears throat> since we are reco recording the video, people just can go on our, our website and watch the, the slides again. And for the links that we, we presented, uh, I'm going to share them on Facebook, on the, okay. uh, on the, the event uh, website page. Okay, wonderful. So um, this page here actually has, uh, if you click on either of these two images, if you're looking at the slideshow uh, presentation, you actually have access to a booklet uh, which is a companion for gardeners. And in there, there will be more information about how to make some uh, homemade insecticides so you can uh, respond to the needs of your garden. Are there any, any questions that people would like to bring up? Um, discussion points? Did I answer everyone's questions? Um, oh, no, I didn't. I'm gonna, here's one. Plant food, is plant food the same as fertilizer? I think that was the question. Um, it actually is, but um, when you buy a plant food at the store, uh, usually what you're buying, depending on where you go, I suppose, you're buying stuff that is actually produced uh, using non-renewable resources. So, um, you know, when you buy like liquids um, that have, um, usually there's like three numbers on the package. It'll often say 20, 20, 20. When you get these numbers that are exactly the same, usually that means that these uh, fertilizers are being made uh, artificially. Um, and, you know, we know that they're effective. They're really great uh, in, in helping your plant grow. They'll usually refer to as plant food. Uh, fertilizer, usually the way that I've learned is we're really natural fertilizer and we're really referring to using uh, natural uh, resources uh, to feed our plants. So things like the fish emulsion that we talked about earlier, the shrimp powder, um, the algae, they both have the same effect, uh, but in terms of marketing, they can mean different things. Uh, any other questions? Um, yes, Alejandra, you gave us a recipe for baking soda spray. I can't remember what that's for. Ah, okay, so uh, the VS spray is actually really good for a number of things. So it's, it's very good for late blend. Uh, you can also use it for uh, powdery mildew. Um, and you can also use it for early blight as well, which is not too different from the late blight. Uh, but early, we didn't talk about this here. You can look it up on uh, one of the, the pages that we looked at. If you look at the Iris phytoprotection website, it should be under the, the, the area of tomatoes. So early blight can also benefit from that. Uh, it's one where your, your leaves start getting these brown spots with a yellow halo around, around mm -hmm. it. Uh, usually, yeah. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Um, I have one more, Alejandra. I asked about the celery mosaic virus. I understand that it's carried by aphids. So if I treat my celery for aphids, would that help? Theoretically, I mean, if, uh, if you have, uh, yeah, if you have aphids, uh, ideally what you would wanna do to um, before any other problems emerge, try to get rid of the aphids. So um, uh, things that we talked about were things like the ladybugs. You can buy ladybugs that will eat them. Uh, you can use the garlic spray for that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a really great one. Um, but the mosaic virus, if it's the same as um, the virus that can be spread from tobacco, there isn't much you can do about the virus once you have it. As we said earlier, like viruses are kind of funny that mm. way. Yeah, well. that's what I feared. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, thanks. Yeah. yeah, try that. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, okay, thanks. Good, thank you. This was great. Wonderful.
Anyone else have any questions? Amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming out this evening. Um, tune in. We've got some more uh, workshops coming up throughout uh, the summer uh, that we are constantly doing one in French and one in English. So if you want to go through some of the same material, if you want to do it a second time and get the French version as well, it's always uh, useful. Um, I encourage you to come and, and participate. Uh, Caroline, she's uh, our local uh, agronomer, so agrologist. So she's got a lot of really fascinating knowledge um, and she's super passionate about presenting to people who are excited to, to learn more. So thank you for coming out and have a great night. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Christina. Bye, Jane. <laughs> Bye. Merci. Bye. Ciao. <clears throat> For Alejandra, I, I already posted the, all the links on on Facebook. Okay. So people can access to the to the links right now. Oh, okay, that's great. And then, do I have to stop recording? Yeah, I do. Right here, I go. Stop recording. I want to make sure I get it right. Do you want to stop cloud recording? Yes. <clears throat>